If you've been following retro gaming news, then you've no doubt already heard about the Z-Pocket game. This is the first DIY device that I'm featuring on this channel, and I'm very excited to give you this glimpse into the Chinese DIY scene. This device is the latest creation from DIY modder Lao Zhang, who has gained quite a following and presence in China for his creative upgrades on popular devices like the RS-97 and the BitBoy. These devices are typically powered by the inner components of cell phones, which means that they gain all of the benefits of Android in a form factor that's actually appropriate for gaming. I was fortunate enough to get my hands on a beta copy of his latest console, along with a quick interview for all of you here on YouTube. Due to the nature of this device, I'm going to be splitting coverage up into a few different videos. This first video is going to focus specifically on the build of this device. On first glance, you may notice something very familiar here. The controls on both the left and the right side come directly from a Vita, so that should give you some indication of the type of quality that you're going to be getting here. It's important to note that these things are not connected via Bluetooth, so your latency with these things is going to be as low as possible on an Android device, which should be great news for those of you that really worry about latency on Android devices. Speaking specifically about the controls, you have the ability to turn off the controls on this unit via a switch located near the D-pad, which I find to be very useful in times when you want to do something on this device that doesn't require controller inputs. If we take a look at the inside of the engineering sample that I have, we can see the level of modding that went into bringing this device to life. On the right and left sides, you can find controller boards that reroute several of the original device's features along with providing OTG support for the controllers. One of the most obvious mods in this case is the expanded battery. This device carries a 3,800 milliamp hour battery up from the stock configuration of 2,500. We are so used to only seeing the finished versions of products when we buy them, but these engineering samples really give us a look into how a device transforms over time. The unit that I have in front of me is missing several of the things found in the fully released version of this model, like a huge heatsink and a completely different cable routing system with a different battery connection. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the rest of the unit. You can see here I have an SD card slot, and my device actually came with a 64 gigabyte card filled with all of the ROMs that you'll see in later videos. In the middle of the unit, you can see there's a big air vent here. The developer has actually gone out of his way to make this device run as cool as possible, with the default CPU clock set to 2.15 GHz. This unit doesn't seem to get too hot during use, but I will be doing a lot of stress tests in the next video that I do on this unit. We round this whole thing off with a micro USB charging port that is also wired to our controller board. This entire unit is actually very easy to service and you can access the internals by just unscrewing the screws located around the perimeter of this device. I'm just going to quickly rotate this around a little bit more to give you some profile shots of the unit. The shoulder buttons on my sample have a little bit of play to them that the developer has stated he's not really satisfied with. He plans on making some modifications to the printing design to have these sit a little bit better than you can see on screen right now. Near our top shoulder buttons, you can find another set of vents to aid in the cooling of the CPU with a very nice volume rocker and a tactile switch located in the middle of the device. If we compare this thing to the other devices that I've covered so far on this channel, you can really get an idea for how compact this thing really is. It's slightly bigger than the RG350, but it's just as thin as the brand new Pocket Go 2. From the test that I've done so far, I can say that this thing is absolutely amazing in the hand. It's super comfortable and the controls are unbeatable. This case itself is obviously a 3D printed design, but the developer could have made this out of a ton of different materials if cost wasn't a factor. Speaking of the price, this thing is obviously not for sale, but there will be future units with better Snapdragon 800 series processors. This is really a labor of love for the developer, and he hadn't really thought too much about scaling this up for international sales. DIY devices come with a whole other host of challenges than the mass-produced units that we're used to seeing, but hopefully this gives you a small glimpse at what's possible when you have a real passion for the craft. Hello, 这款掌机大概DR的时间为3到4个月 
，用的是八三五的高通骁龙，但是这款机器由于价格偏贵和屏幕偏大，最后放弃选择了。索尼这一款，这款机器的话是 4.3 寸的，它的屏幕大小是足够的复古，玩 PSP 以下是完全 OK 的。测试的尺寸跟 PSP 的尺寸是差不多的，比 PSP 还要窄。呃，它的屏幕够鲜艳、够清晰，玩游戏的话速度非常快。因为高通骁龙800虽然在当下可能会觉得它不够性能好，可能，但是，但是在。复古游戏里面是绝对足够的，我们只要玩 PSP 以下游戏是绝对足够的。呃，他可以有问到遥感为什么是一个而不是两个？其实我觉得啊，这个 PSP 应该是只需要一个遥感 ，PSP 以下也是只需要一个遥感，因为这个机器是高通骁龙八百的处理器，它并不是性能很优越。我会在第二代的时候 ，ZPG 二代的时候选用八三五的机器，或者是八四五的机器，这样的话会选用双摇杆玩 PS2， 呵呵然后还有 NGC 这一类的游戏，它会选用到双摇杆。呃，这个做这个项目最大的挑战啊，其实最大的挑战其实是过程啊，过程中会遇到很多很多的问题，一一去解决它。其实对我对于我来说的话，嗯，因为我是有一个。有一个 team， 有好几个玩家组合而成的，有很多东西不一定我会，但是他会，这个东西就形成一个整合，做出一个很好的机器出来。下一步我会做呃 ZPG 的二代 ，ZPG 的三代，嗯，也可能会做无印掌机，哈哈，也可能会做无印掌机，这个看看情况吧。嗯，不过我还是比较希望后面跟托马斯。就是呃，三五零 H 的作者去合作另外的掌机，比如说新款的高性能的开源掌机，也可能会去做。当然 ，DIY 我还是一直会坚持的。呃，在最后的话，还是特别感谢 Taki，Taki 是一个非常优秀的主播，在国内叫主播，优秀的主播，然后优秀的测评师，感谢国外的玩家们，谢谢你们。